So I'm really, really excited for our finale tonight. Um, what we usually do here at Body is you come tell me a story. We're all grassroots amateurs, but there is a world of professional storytelling. And the craft is amazing. And I met the next storyteller, yeah. I met the next storyteller at the National Storytelling Convention about a year ago. I felt like a whore in church. <laughs> there were a lot of prairie hats. There were a lot of dream catchers. <laughs> storytelling. I am so in love with storytelling. I don't care if I don't fit in. I want to learn how to tell a story like someone who does this for a living. And late one night, I ran into a woman and we started swapping stories with each other. And, you know, I felt like I finally fit in, you know, like she got what we do. She got, you know, the emotion behind this. We're different. We're sex and storytelling. The rest of the world doesn't have this. We're very lucky. But, um, yeah. <laughs> but to tell a story, a story that, you know, like the skill and the craft just amazes me. She's been a professional storyteller for over 25 years. She is a rape and assault speaker, and Body is very proud to bring her show to San Francisco next week which is a one-woman show about uh, the journey back from being assaulted. And it will be at the Center for Sex and Culture, Tuesday, November 15th. She is an amazing performer. And she flew in from Minneapolis yesterday. That's how lucky. She's not been to San Francisco since she was 16 years old. So y'all are going to be really nice to her, right? Hell yeah! She came here. Please give a huge welcome to Nancy Donable. I was so glad I left my prairie out at home that day. <laughs> I have to say, it in the sort of mainstream storytelling community, um, yeah, I don't get to invited to tell stories like this. Um, so this is when I don't, this is when I don't really tell. She kept talking about craft and I was like, yeah, I've never told this story in public. <laughs> um, he was standing right behind me with his mouth as close to my ear as he could get, whispering instructions, turn to the left. 40 degrees. Okay, now, now bend down some. Now say, hello, little boy. Okay, there's something you should know. Because um, you might have a different picture in your head than what's actually happening. Uh, I was having my first professional acting job um, in a Mickey Mouse costume. When I say his, his lips were close to my ear, I mean the enormous fiberglass mouse <laughs> ear. I had one of those huge Mickey Mouse heads on, and um, I had black leotards, black tights, red suspenders, the red shorts with the big buttons, spats um, on my feet. And in fact, 40 degrees to my left, there was a little boy. Um, I just couldn't see him. I was a freshman in college. I, it wasn't, I wasn't even in college yet. It was orientation weekend. I was 18 years old. I got to the theater department. They said, we're having auditions. I was away at school. The first person in my family to go away to school, it was unheard of. I'd gone all the way from Chicago to Milwaukee. <laughs> I was a rebel. <laughs> And I was away from home. I'd already been taken to the Oriental Theater to see Rocky Horror Picture Show for the first time. And that had been really interesting. St. Scholastica Academy for Young Ladies had not prepared me for that. Um, people think that's a joke, and it's just not. <laughs> um, so the person I was with was like, here, you'll need toilet paper. I was like, what are we talking about? Oh, oh, OK. Um, and then we had auditions. And General Electric was having this big hundreds 
anniversary and they were sending the um, Up With People music team. I don't know if you know the Up, Up With People, you meet them wherever you go. Um, they had touring musical people and they were going around the country doing these big events for GE employees for their 100th anniversary. But every town they went to, they went to a local college and auditioned for Mickey, Donald, and Goofy. Because what they were giving away was like packages for families to go to Disney World. And we had auditions and I was the right size for the costume. <laughs> that had never happened to me before. And, and, um, and I, could, I could kind of do the voice. Not really well, but enough. <laughs> I think it was more I fit the costume. But I was gonna get paid $87 for three shows and I had lines and everything, a script I had to read. I had to do banter with the CEO of General Electric, but it was really uncomfortable because we were on stage in front of all this family, like kids and everything, and doing a game show where I was emceeing and they were hosting and he kept saying things like, really? I've never seen a boy mouse shaped like that before. It was like, really? In front of families? Really? <laughs> Really? I mean, I had my own black leotard and tights that I had to wear under the costume, which I'd had to get as part of my supplies as a theater major. Um, so I had them. But then they had a reception after every show, and all the families were there. And of course, who wants to talk to Mickey Mouse? It's little kids. If you haven't been inside a fiberglass head, and I have to say that this is a crowd where perhaps some have. Um, <laughs> <coughs> are all painted black, it's all painted on the outside, and, and it's like this screen with paint in it, and it was really hot, it was August, I didn't realize how much I was gonna sweat. The first time I tried it on and I was in it, my glasses fell off and they kept bouncing around and rattling in the bottom of it. I had to go get one of those athletic bands and put it on to keep my glasses on, but it didn't matter because I still couldn't see. So the first reception I was at, there are all these people talking to me, I can't see where I am, I've got this big hat on with the ears, someone calls, hey Mickey, and I turn around and one of my ears hits a grandmother the back of the head. <laughs> so they assigned me a keeper, a mouse wrangler, <laughs> Craig, who's standing behind me now. Craig, who is really good friends with Steve. I'd been hanging out with Steve and kind of flirting with Steve, and he was really nice, and he'd invited me back to their hotel after the last show of her party, and I was like, oh my God, I don't have to ask my mom because I'm away at school, and sure, I'll go to your hotel in a suburb I've never heard of with people I don't know. Why not? And, um, but Craig was one of his really good friends and I'd sort of hoped Steve would meet my Wrangler because Steve was kind of a nice guy and Craig was kind of a bad boy, but Craig was a really cute bad boy, really dark hair. Everybody keeps saying piercing blue eyes tonight, but his were the best. <laughs> and, and I had this voice, I came behind my ear, turn to your left, 40 degrees, a little boy in a red shirt. And I would say, hello little boy, you look so cute in your red shirt. I would never see the child. Never see him at all. Um, there's something so intimate about someone giving you directions like that, protecting you behind your fiberglass ear. <laughs> Though Steve had invited me to the party, it was Craig I sat with on the bus. I was still in the outfit, there wasn't time to change. We put the head on a different seat. Um, <laughs> I had my head leaning against his shoulder. I was feeling a little bit bad about Steve. What I did not know, um, though I figured it out later, was you know they're touring around the country and they're auditioning everywhere. He and Steve were having a contest for who could bag the most mice. Um, <laughs> so you know the girl mice anyway. Nobody went after Donald or Goofy. They didn't have roles. They just did crowd control. Um, I was the star. Eighty-seven dollars for three shows. Um, <laughs> So I, I'm going to the hotel with them. I think we're going to this party. I get to the party and it's like, it's not a party, it's Steve and Craig's room. And there's potato chips and Jane Fonda on the TV, uh, Cat Baloo, and we're making jokes about the cat and I'm in the mouse outfit still. And then Steve's like, I'm gonna go talk to so-and-so in a different room and he's gone and, and yeah, we start kissing and we're kissing and we're kissing. And um, he, you know, I'd had a boyfriend in high school and we'd made out in my basement and it was the 70s and halter tops were very in and so other things had happened. But um, 
But things were happening in my body that I had never experienced before. Like places were getting moist that only got moist when you had to put like tampons there. And <laughs> I knew it was not time for that. And I kept thinking, oh my God, I've wet my mouse suit. Like what is happening? I don't know what's happening. I just have to say Catholic grade school does not explain this part of the reproductive <laughs> process. They're telling you don't, they're not telling you, and then you will get wet. Maybe they think the women never will. Um, <laughs> but anyway, I, I, he noticed my discomfort. And there was this sudden moment where he pulled back and he said, how old are you? I said, 18? 18, 18, I thought you were at least 21. Wait a minute, what did you think was gonna happen tonight? I was like, I don't know, I just started college, you guys seem nice, I wanted to come to a party. Don't you have brothers? And suddenly, like, that was it. He became my sex guide. He explained to me what was happening in my body. He explained all the processes. He explained why it happened. Um, we sat on the bed, fully clothed, me in the mouse suit, um, eating potato chips. Well, I finally got sex ed from someone who understood it. Um, <laughs> but now he was all protective big brother. That question, don't you have any brothers? Why, yes. And they explained it to me, like, no, did you have a sister that you took aside and explained lubrication to? No. <laughs> and then we hear this little at the door and we're going, come in, come in. And it's Steve coming back and he's afraid he hasn't given us enough time. He doesn't want to walk in. And we're like, come in already. He comes in, we're totally clothed, we're eating potato chips. And he's like, huh? What just happened here? But Craig and I had had the best conversation. It turned out we belonged to the same Teens Encounter Christ retreat program. <laughs> and, and he was telling me all about his girlfriend that he'd broken up with in college. And oh God, like not in college, but in high school. And, and like she'd gotten pregnant and she'd gotten an abortion, but it was okay that she got an abortion, except he was, she talked to her about it because it was his kid too. And like, we were telling each other stuff like, you don't tell people. And then he said, all right, I'm, or at least not total strangers while you're in a mouse outfit. <laughs> then he took me down to the lobby and said, I'll, I'll send you home to the dorm in the cab. And he called a cab for me and Jim Croce, Time in a Bottle, was playing on the radio and we were sitting on the sofa and the, you know, and just having this romantic, oh my God, and just those eyes, those eyes. And I have this fantasy that we're gonna write to each other and stay in touch and like, yeah, that's not gonna happen. But I have a photo of him where he has this wicked smile on him, but these incredibly kind eyes, and I'm so glad that the eyes won me. <laughs> and he kissed me goodbye, and he put me in a cab, and I put my mouse head on the seat next to me, and I went off to school. <laughs> Thank you. Oh!